Well, good morning. I hope that you are doing well on this most unusual morning. I know it's uh, got to be strange being in your home uh, watching this right now. To those of you who regularly gather with us, um, it's good to have you. For those of you who are uh, brand new to Very Best Baptist Church, uh, thank you for joining us. It is a, it's a strange day, but it's a good day. During these next couple of weeks that we're going to be doing this, uh, while we cannot gather as the body of Christ, we can, however, join one another in spirit and in truth, and we can, uh, as households and individuals, learn together, and we can pray for one another, and we can read God's word together. And as soon as it's humanly possible and the government allows it, <laughs> then we will gather together as the body of Christ. <laughs> uh, trust me, I am excited for that day, and I'm sure everyone else is as well. Welcome to Very Best Baptist Church. In this room here, we gather to worship the triune God through prayer, praise, and proclamation, at all times pointing to the cross, the symbol of the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, that God took on flesh and became a man, Jesus of Nazareth, who lived the life that none of us could ever live and died the death that all of us deserve. And on the third day, he rose from the grave, triumphing over all enemies, including death, hell, and the grave. And anyone who repents of their sins and believes on Jesus will not perish, but have everlasting life. And that is a very good news for a very bad day. Let's pray and then we'll dig into God's word. Father God, I ask for your blessing on this morning. As uh, many people have turned on their devices to hear about you, Lord, I pray that your name would be praised above any other thing that is in this world. Lord, that we would turn our eyes to you in a time of trouble, Lord, that we would not be overwhelmed by the news, Lord, because we have the greatest news of all time, and it is about your Son. Lord, I pray that this morning we would lift up the holy name of Jesus, and we would sing, and we would pray, and we would praise you with everything that is in our souls. In Jesus' name, amen. If you would turn with me to the book of Jeremiah, we're going to be in chapter 29. It's in the Old Testament. It's about, uh, it's about halfway, uh, halfway through, a little past halfway. If you have uh, an entire, uh, if you have a, an ESV uh, and it's a regular font size, then uh, it might be on page 656 like it is in mine. We're going to be in Jeremiah chapter 29. Now, while you're turning there, I am going to give you a little background on this book. I don't know if I've actually ever preached out of this book before, um, but this book was written as a collection of uh, sermons and poems of the prophet Jeremiah. That was his name. He was a prophet that lived about 600 years before, uh, before the time of Christ. That's about 2,600 years uh, ago from now. That's a long, long time. He was a man that was, uh, that was chosen by God, and God raised him up at a very troubled time to be his voice, uh, to speak the word of God to God's chosen people. Just before and during the beginning of the Babylonian exile. And if you're asking, what is the Babylonian exile or uh, possibly the Babylonian captivity? Well, it's a 70-year event that happened in the history of Israel. Uh, it's a time that God used the enemies of Israel uh, to capture them and take them out of the promised land. You might be wondering, why is that, and where did he take them? Well, the, they took them to the country of Babylon, or the place of Babylon, uh, and that is modern-day Iraq, not the loveliest place in the world. Um, and the reason that God did this is because Israel uh, wouldn't stop worshiping false gods and idols. They just wouldn't stop. They just had to do it. It was their thing. So for a time, God used Israel's enemies to take the Jews from their homeland and to rid his people of 
their idolatrous behavior. It was a rough time in Israel's history and one that they brought upon themselves. It's not like God didn't tell them not to do it. So for uh, that 70 year period, um, they were under the captivity of Babylon and their enemies. They were the slaves of those enemies. Uh, But don't worry, God did punish Israel's enemies uh, ultimately for being wicked and persecuting the Jews. It's, uh, as he always does, it's just never a good idea to persecute the Jews, no matter what. So this book, titled Jeremiah, is the voice of a prophet of God who is crying out to God's people. And he's not just crying out to God's people uh, from God saying, uh, woe is me, listen to me. No, that's not what it is at all. Uh, Jeremiah, for most of the book, is actually crying out uh, the words, against the words of the other prophets, false prophets that were in the nation, that were telling Israel what God was saying when they had no idea. Uh, They they said many things. At this time, uh, in their culture, they had what what were their pastors or their preachers or their politicians uh, that were making promises that they couldn't keep. They, uh, everything they said was antithetical to the teaching of God. It didn't line up with his word at all. Promises of health and wealth, promises of prosperity. They were telling uh, God's people at first that God would never let his people go into exile. It wouldn't even be possible. God would never let that happen to God's own chosen people. And then when they did go into captivity, into exile, uh, they said that God didn't want them to be in exile, and so he didn't want them to put down roots and to marry and continue on with their family lineages. So they, didn't, uh, they said that God didn't want them to get married and have babies and, uh, because this whole exile thing wasn't God's plan. God didn't plan for this, so don't do it. Don't carry on with life as you normally would. It's not going to last. That's what they said over and over again. They didn't want God's people to invest their lives in a foreign land because obviously that's not what God wanted them to do. They wanted Babylon to fall apart around them so that they could get out of there and get home as quick as possible. But that's not what God had said. That's not the terms and conditions of the agreement. So God raised up Jeremiah to preach the truth, not what uh, the people wanted to hear. Jeremiah did not make empty promises to tickle their ears. He instead proclaimed God's word, God's word, not man's word. So the prophet Jeremiah takes God's word to God's people. And this is what he says. If you're there, I hope you are. Jeremiah chapter 29. We're going to start in verse 10. We're only going to read two verses of this. If you have time to read the entire thing, please do. It's a great book. Wonderful book. So chapter 10 or chapter 29, verse 10 says this. For thus says the Lord, when 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will visit you and I will fulfill to you my promises and bring you back to this place, the promised land. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. Or verse 11, as I learned it as a kid, for I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to help you and not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future. Amen. The other day I was at Hobby Lobby before everything was shut down, and I was looking at the lovely wall art it was, uh, it was beautiful, actually. And I saw about 15 different Bible verses from the book of Jeremiah. Yeah, yeah. And, and my thought was, good grief, Hobby Lobby is obsessed with the Babylonian exile. Yeah. But in, in all seriousness, the question is, why do Christians gravitate to a book that was written by a prophet to the Jews 2,600 years ago in a time of rebellious idol worship and self-destruction. We have to wonder why that is as Christians. Why are we attracted to that book? There is a lot of quotes from that that you'll find at any Christian bookstore, if those still exist, and Hobby Lobby or any place that has Bible verses. 
And I'll tell you why. If that's the question, I'll tell you why. It's because uh, the book of Jeremiah is filled to the brim with God's judgment, yes, but also with verse after verse after verse after verse after verse that could be summed up like this from God. Though you are wicked, O Israel, though you have abandoned me, though you have chased after wealth and false gods and have worshipped yourselves and not me, I, the Lord, am faithful and I am sending you hope. So why do Christians love Jeremiah 29, 11 so much? It's because it contains two words that are precious to every believer. And those words are hope and future. You can't get uh, any more words that mean more to a Christian than that. When trouble arises, we think on our hope and our future. Over these next two uh, strange weeks, or hopefully just one more week, uh, these are the words that we're going to take a look at. These are the words that we're going to be focusing on, hope and future. It's amazing to me that J Jeremiah 29.11 is a verse that was preached by God's prophet against the prosperity preachers of Jeremiah's day. That's very strange to me. And yet today, it is a verse that is used and abused left and right by false prophets and shyster charlatans of the 21st century. The ones that they say, if you just have enough faith, then your bank account will be full. If you just have enough faith, then maybe that terminal illness you have will go away. If you just have enough faith and give me some money, then maybe this verse will apply to you. But we don't want to fall into the trap of worshiping money like the charlatans and false prophets and the prosperity preachers do of today. So this week, we're going to be focusing on the word hope and what it means biblically. What it means to face an unusual and unsure situation like today. Because the Old Testament was written in Hebrew and the New Testament was written in Greek, the word for hope here in Jeremiah 29.11 is the Hebrew word tikvah. Literally, it, it means a cord or a rope. Yeah, crazy, right? A cord or a rope, tikvah. It means something, it's a something like a cord or a rope, something that you hold on to uh, for dear life. Figuratively, as it is in this uh, verse, it means an expectation or a thing hoped for. Or a thing longed for. That's what it actually says. Hope. In short, it's what we hold on to when we are anxious or upset about this life. Because not every day is perfect. That's why we're where we are right now. Things can happen in a second, a split second. The world gets turned upside down. What starts off as uh, distant news from around the world becomes uh, a joke and then becomes an inkling of a fear, becomes a full-on fear, and everybody is shut up in their homes and nobody wants to go outside as for fear of dying. And that all happened overnight. Hmm. If you would turn with me to the New Testament, we're going to be in Matthew chapter 6. We're going to hear the, the words of our Lord Jesus as he speaks on this very subject. Matthew chapter 6 is right in the middle of the Sermon on the Mount. If you're looking for a page in the ESV, it's uh, 811. So Jesus is right in the middle of the Sermon on the Mount, it's one of the most famous sermons of all time, if not the most famous sermon of all time. And this is where Jesus is right next to the Sea of Galilee, and he has slipped away from the massive crowds that are following him and pressing in around him, wanting food and healing. And he went up onto a rocky hill uh, called what we call the Mount, and he sat down to teach his disciples. So this sermon, preached by the greatest preacher of all time, 
is very much near and dear to my own heart, and I know that it is near and dear to the hearts of millions of believers around the world today. Uh, let's listen in and, uh, and hear what Jesus is saying in Matthew chapter 6. We're going to start in verse 24 and read through to the end of the chapter. Jesus says this in verse 24, 624. No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. Therefore, I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his lifespan? And why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin, and yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore, therefore, do not be anxious, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. I'm going to read that one more time. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself, sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Amen. What is striking about these words is that Jesus knows the future very, very well. And he is speaking to his disciples. He's not just speaking to the crowds. He's speaking to his own disciples, the very same ones that would later become his apostles, his messengers, the very same ones that would eventually be martyred for their allegiance to the Lord Jesus. All of the apostles met gruesome ends. All of them. Either beaten to death, or stabbed, or stoned, or flayed by whip, or speared, or crucified, or beheaded, or shot with arrows, or boiled in oil. And that is just the, the apostles. It's just them. That's just the apostles. That's not even counting the thousands upon thousands upon thousands upon thousands of brothers and sisters who have met bloody ends at the hands of their enemies in horrific, horrific ways. Over the last 2,000 years, yes, and also including the 350 plus brothers and sisters that have died this very year in 2020 around the world, and we're not that far into it. So when Jesus says, do not be anxious about your life, he means it. He means it. Do not be anxious about your life because life and death are held in his hands. Not in ours, not in the media's, not in some other country, and definitely not in the government's. His. Hope and future are held in his hands. As Jesus' followers, our hope is not in temporal things, because temporal things are temporary. Moth and rust destroys them. Yes, even toilet paper. Our hope, our hope is not in, in this world, that this world will save us. Our hope is in heaven, and his name is Jesus. 
If you feel overwhelmed right now about the times that we're living in, it's understandable. These are very odd and confusing times, and nobody knows what's going on. Nobody. Nobody knows what's going on. But God does. I would say to us as Christians, the first thing that we should do if you are overwhelmed is to stop letting the world preach to your heart. What do I mean by that? Well, all proclamation is preaching. Everything that is spoken, everything that is proclaimed is preaching. But the question is, what is the message? If you turn on the news right now, at this very moment, you're going to see something. You're going to hear someone proclaiming something, and that message is fear. It's what it is, because it makes money, and the news is a business. It's not for your own good. And right now, the news has a captive audience, 24-7. And what are they preaching? Good news? No, definitely not good news. Fear, and only fear. What's going to happen tomorrow? What are we going to do? What if nothing works out? What if we don't get a bill passed? Which politician is going to save us? Uh, We're we're going to lose all of our money. The the country is going to disappear. We're not going to have USA tomorrow. It's not going to happen. The world is ending. And then tune back tomorrow and you'll hear more of this wonderful news. Panic and chaos. 24-7. So helpful. So incredibly helpful. While this world is on lockdown, I, uh, I would suggest to you if, you, if you are a follower of Jesus, to instead of watching the news 24-7 and letting some fear monger preach into your heart, fear 24-7, take a moment and turn off the TV, distance yourself from social media, put down your phone for a little bit, turn it off if you have to, my goodness, and read the words of our Lord from the Sermon on the Mount. That's Matthew chapters 5, 6, and 7. Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7 is the Sermon on the Mount. And it doesn't matter how long it takes you to read through it because we got lots of time on our hands. In all reality, as, as Christians, I believe that we can come out on the other side of this strangeness in our world with a new or a renew, renewed passion to trust and obey our King. We call Him Lord, right? We call Him Lord, we call Him Savior, and He says, why do you call me Lord if you don't do what I command? So if we're going to call Him Lord, if we're going to call Him King, that means He owns us. So if we're going to trust and obey, it should not be just for one hour a week. If we have realized anything from this time, it's that that one hour a week is precious. This world is thrown upside down, mainly for Christians in this way that we don't get to gather as the body of Christ. It hurts. It hurts me. It hurts me that I don't get to be with you. It hurts my heart. One hour a week is not enough to spend with our Lord. But my hope is that we will have a renewed passion to trust and obey our King, not with just one hour, but with our daily lives, every single day, Sunday through Sunday, the whole thing. That whether we lie down or whether we get up or whether we go to or fro, or no matter what we're doing, that we wouldn't waste this life, that we wouldn't waste any moment because we don't know what is on the other side. We have no idea what tomorrow holds. We have no idea. My hope is that no matter what we're doing, that in, in, instead of spending just a tiny bit of our heart, maybe one hour a week on Christ, that perhaps instead we could love our God who we call God and Savior and Lord and King, that we could love Him with all of our hearts, with all of our souls, with all of our minds and with all of our strength. That love, that love, 
would mark everything that is in our minds, everything in our thoughts, and everything in our deeds, everything we do in this life, that it would be marked by Christ. That no matter where we go, no matter what we do, no matter what we say, we wouldn't just slip into the mode of Christianity in this modern world that loves to drink coffee together. But instead, that we would speak of our King with hope and excitement and love and adoration. That we wouldn't think of him just as someone who provides a way for us to escape eternal death. But that we would find life now in him every single day in everything that we say and do that we would be marked by christianity we're moving into a world where christians are going to be different no longer can we say that this world is just a christian nation because it's not My hope is that love would mark everything, that love for God, that would mark everything that we say and do, that it would be clear and evident to everyone around us and everyone who sees us, sees what we do, or even reads our Facebook posts would know that we are believers and that we wouldn't waste any moment on this world because Jesus is our hope. Jesus is our future. And that is comforting to those who love him. Because all things work together for good. For those who love God. For those who are called according to his purpose. And we should take great comfort in that. Now if you are not a follower of Jesus. I don't really have good world news for you. This world is terrifying and crazy and if your life and heart is found in temporal things uh, there's not much hope there there is no hope or satisfaction that can be found in this world certainly not in this system if your hope is in politicians politicians are fake if you're thinking that come November, things are going to be okay because your guy is going to be in the White House. It's not going to be okay for eternity. You get four years no matter what it is. Politicians are fake. If your hope is in prosperity, prosperity is fleeting. It goes away. You put money in your wallet and it disappears. It's not going to keep you for eternity. If your hope is in people, People fail. But there is good news for you. It's that there is only one hope in this world, and his name is Jesus. And Jesus died to save sinners, which is great, because all have sinned, and all have fallen short of the glory of God. So I don't know what tomorrow holds, but I do know who holds tomorrow. And that is Jesus Christ, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And he's not just good enough to be. He actually is King of kings and Lord of lords. And today, if you're not a follower of Jesus, I say repent of your sins. Let them go and cry out to him for salvation. He is quick to forgive and he is mighty to save. Now, if you are a believer, I would say the same thing to you. Repent of your sins, the sins that you hold on to all the time and say, God understands, he's okay with these sins for me to hold on to. Specifically right now, that looks like fear and worry. Fear and worry. It means that you have taken your eyes off of eternity. You have taken your eyes off of Jesus. So repent of that and turn your eyes upon Jesus, who is the king of all. These are troubled times. These are weird times. These are unsure times. But for the Christian, these are temporary times. Our hope is in heaven, and his name is Jesus. Let's pray. Father, I I pray 
for those who have ears to hear. Lord, I pray that this is not just another day of, of wasted worship on comfort and money. Lord, the grass withers and the flower fades, but your word endures forever. Lord, I thank you that we get to worship you every week, that we get to gather. Lord, we have taken for granted all of the weeks that we have had before today. Lord, I pray that we would never do that again. Lord, all things were created through you and for you, and you uphold all things by the word of your power. Lord, I pray that we would not forget that. Lord, as a people, that we would stand up and we proclaim your name above the news of today. Lord, that the good news would overtake this world full of bad news. And that no matter what, as Christians, we would say the name of Jesus with adoration and with praise. Lord, we need you. And I thank you. In the holy name of Jesus, I pray. Amen.